Exodus 3, reading verses 14 and 15. It's a highly significant expression in the Bible to help us to understand the sovereignty of God. God did not tell Moses, I have. He said, I am. So that existence centers in God. Let me say that again. Existence centers in God. Including Satan. But let me clarify quickly. Satan is alive by the power of God. All sinners are alive by the power of God. All saints are alive by the power of God. Every animal is alive by the power of God. That tree is alive by the power of God. And if these were real, they would be alive. They are by the power of God. Existence centers in God. Nothing can be disconnected from God. Let me say that again. I don't want you to think I'm saying nothing can be disconnected from God. I'm saying nothing can exist unless it is somehow connected to God. Okay. Nothing. Because everything exists by law. And all law originates and centers in God. So God told Moses, tell the children of Israel, I am that I am. Now, remember our sub-theme is looking back. Now, we're looking back at what God told Moses, then we will go forward to the New Testament. Let us go to John. A sermon in shoes. Let's go to John. Chapter 14, we shall read verse 6. Let's read the words of Jesus Christ in John 14, verse 6. Very familiar passage. What does Jesus say? He is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He could have said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, which is precisely what he meant. Jesus does not say, I have the way, I have the truth, I have the life. Because if he said, I have the way, then someone could say, I'll come and get it, and then leave. So you go to Christ, you get the way, you say thanks, and you go your way. Or you go to Christ, you get the truth. You say thank you, bye. Or you go to Christ, you get the life. You say thank you, bye. It does not work like that. To have the life, who can finish what I'm about to say? You have to have Christ. Life isn't something he has. Life is something he is. Now, it'll take a while for that to digest, and no human being can fully digest it, but we must try. We must chew on it. Let me say it again. Christ does not so much have life as he is life. So when you, those who looked at Christ were looking at life. When you looked at Christ, you looked at truth. In other words, if someone were to, you know, Pilate said, what is truth? And he's looking right at truth. And he asks the question, what is truth? The way that I should live, look at Christ, that's the way. That's the way, right there. That man. The life, that man. The truth, that man. And so Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 35, and he said unto them, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. You don't go to Christ and get the bread. You go to Christ and get Christ and stay with Christ. He is, not he has. In John chapter 10 verse 9, I am the door. And all of this comes from Exodus 3 verse 14. Say unto them, I am, I am. Now, when you saw Christ, you saw what he preached. Did you get what I just said? When you saw Christ, you saw a sermon 
in shoes or sandals or whatever they wore. In Evangelism, page 636, paragraph 1, Ellen White writes these enlightening words. Christ carried out in his life his own divine teachings. What he preached was how he lived. Let's see that in the life of an outstanding Bible character. I just said, what Christ preached is what he lived. What he said is what he was. Evangelism 636, paragraph 1, Christ carried out in his life his own divine teachings. In other words, you would hear him, you would not only hear what he said, you would see what he said by the way he lived his life. There cannot be a dislocation, a separation between what we preach and what we do. Let's go to Genesis chapter 7. As we continue a sermon in shoes. Genesis 7, reading verse 1. You have Genesis 7, reading verse 1. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. God described Noah as righteous. Now let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2. We shall read verse 5. 2 Peter chapter 2, reading verse 5. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Now let us put next to each other 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 5 and Genesis 7 verse 1. Let's read. Reread 2 Peter 2 verse 5. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person. Next statement says what? A preacher of righteousness. He was a preacher of, that's what he preached. That's what came out of his mouth. That's what he said. That's his talk. But Genesis 7 verse 1 says, and the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous. Now, according to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, what did Noah preach? Righteousness. Righteousness. According to God's description of the man in Genesis 7, 1, what was Noah? Righteous. His life was righteousness. So what he said was righteousness. Who he was, his life was a living example of what he said. Therein lies the power of the church. A lot of people refuse to join the church for one embarrassing reason. Embarrassing reason. The members of the church whom they know do not live up to what the church says. And so the question is, why should I join a church that says one thing and the members do something else? There are no sermons in shoes for people to see. You tell a student something and the person may get 10% of it. You show the student something, the student gets a larger degree. You let the student do it the student gets 100%. Are you following me, teachers? We are to live out the life of Christ. It is not enough to preach. We must preach, and then with all humility, we must say to those whom we preach, watch what I just said in action. In other words, you should be Sabbath-keeping. <laughs> Someone said, Amen, Amen. You didn't hear what I said. It is not enough to be a Sabbath keeper. When people look at us, they must see Sabbath keeping. The observers from sunset on Friday, sunset on Sabbath, they observe our behavior, our speech, our dress, our eating, our interaction. That is Sabbath keeping. Watch that man. There's an interesting story, true or not, I'm not entirely sure. 
this uh, Bible worker came to town and uh, to give a Bible study. I went to the house of a lady, I think it was, and knocked. She opened the door. And he came in and she agreed to get the Bible study. And he started to talk about Jesus. And the lady said, or it was a lady or a man, some, I know that guy you're talking about. The Bible worker says, well, I'm glad to know that. She says, he lives down the street. The Bible worker said, no, 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 no. <laughs> Jesus lives in heaven. <laughs> the lady said, no. This man lives down the street. The Bible worker said, no, sister. I hate to correct you in your own house. Jesus does not live on earth. He lives in heaven. The lady insisted. She said, come with me. I'll show you this man. He lives down the street. The two of them walked down the street, went to a house and knocked. Out came an elderly gentleman with a pleasant look on his face, a voice like music. He says, hello, how may I help you? And the old lady said, there he is. <laughs> According to what you said, that's Jesus. Now that man had lived a godly life. Are you with me? And so the lady, having observed him, she said, well, he lives down the street. Jesus says, I am. You and I, attached to Jesus, it must be said of us, what is Sabbath keeping? Watch him. What is forgiveness? Watch her as she interacts with those who abuse her. That is forgiveness in action. That is forgiveness in high heels or low heels, whatever heels she's wearing. What is temperance? I'll tell you what temperance is. Wait until the Adventists have a potluck. Watch that man. That's temperance. Watch him, how he eats and how much. Say amen. <laughs> That's temperance. <laughs> That's temperance. Don't give me words. Show me temperance. And so my brothers and sisters, we must be sermons in shoes. Noah was a sermon in shoes. What is righteousness? Well, I can't see Jesus. Look at Noah. Now, the righteousness isn't his, it is Christ in him. Are you listening to me? But it's righteousness nonetheless. That's righteousness. Where? Right there. Yeah, that man. What is love? That woman. That's love. Just observe her life. She doesn't have love. She is love. Because she and Christ are so closely united, what Christ is at the human level, she is. How oh, you missed it. Notice I said, whatever Christ was at the human level, she is, because she and Christ are one. If you and Christ are one, what Christ is at the human level, so you are. Amen. What shall I say unto the children of Israel? I am that I am. My brothers and sisters, go to 1 John chapter 2. Let's read verse 7 and 8. Verses 7 and 8. 1 John 2, verses 7 and 8. Do you have that? Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Now read verse 8. Again, a new commandment I write unto you. Read the next few words. Which thing is true? Go on. Ah. Hmm. Listen to me. Whatever is true in God must be true in his offspring. Who are his offspring? We are the offspring of the Godhead. Whatever is true in God must be true in us. That, on that principle, Jesus told the scribes and Pharisees, if you were Abraham's children. You remember that verse? How does the verse end? You would do. The works of Abraham. What do cats produce? Little cats. We call them kittens, but they're little cats. What do horses produce? Little horses. What do eagles produce? Little eagles. What does God produce through the act of conversion? Little Christ-like people. Now, not gods, because you can't create God. You understand me? But conversion produces a being... Listen to me carefully. 
who when fully developed is as close to God as any created being has ever been. Let me say it again, slowly. Genuine conversion and the progress that follows produces a being who will ultimately be as close to God and as much like God as is possible for a created being. Conflict and courage. I believe it's page 21, paragraph 5. Ellen White writes these words. God created man for his own glory, that after test and trial, the human family might become one with the heavenly family. Amen. That was God's original desire. After a while, if Adam and Eve passed the test, even unfallen beings are tested. God, in his mysterious way, would have united the human family with the heavenly family, producing a sort of a hybrid that would be the highest created being in all the universe. It was God's purpose to repopulate heaven with the human family if they would show themselves obedient to his every word. And here comes my word again. If they would show themselves obedient to his every word, it was God's original desire to unite humanity with divinity in a way that would produce a being second only to God. Whatever Christ preached, he was. And so Jesus says to Moses, and I'm not making a mistake, I'm correct when I said Jesus. Who is the God of the Old Testament? Jesus. It's Jesus Christ. That is easily proved. It was Christ who said to Moses, I am that I am. That same Christ talking to the Jews in John 8, 56-58. Your father Abraham desired or longed to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? He said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. God isn't was or will be. Something that will be does not exist. Ah, you miss it again. Let me say it again. Something that will be does not exist. So God cannot will be. God is. God is. Now God may do so. I will do that or I will do that. But God always is. My brothers and sisters, God is life. Christ is the resurrection he told uh, the sister of um, Lazarus at the tomb of that of Lazarus I am the resurrection and the life that is why anyone who dies in Christ cannot stay dead somebody ought to say amen, amen. let me say it again if you die in Christ and if you're in Christ Christ is in you and the body dies it cannot stay dead because Christ in you will raise you up. I am the resurrection and the life. I'm what I'm stressing is that the ultimate aim is to have Christ. Amen. Too many of us have religion, not Christ. The Bible doesn't say Judaism is the way, the truth, and the life. Even though Jesus says salvation is of the Jews, he did not say salvation is Jewish. What he meant was the message of salvation has been given to the Jews and they should preach it. So salvation is of the Jews, but it's not Jewish, it is godly. Christ is the life. Christ is the bread. Christ is the way. Christ is the truth. He is all of that. And when we connect to him, we become the same truth. We can't give life, but the life we live is his life. Are you with me? So in that sense, whatever people see in us is what is in Christ. 
So when James and John, not James and John, Peter and John stood before the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 4, the Bible says they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Something about them told the Sanhedrin these men are connected to Christ. God wants with us a union that we do not understand. A oneness. It is seen in the Bible. You see this book? It has two natures. What are they? This book has two natures. It is, well, yes, godliness. But it two natures. And they are? Who? Yes, human and divine. Who physically wrote it? Men. Who constructed the sentences? Men. Who provided the thoughts? God. What spirit possessed the men who wrote? The spirit of God. The Bible is a three-dimensional living example of the communion or the union between divine and human. Jesus Christ came and gave a two-legged example. I am human and divine in one. The greatest mystery in the Bible. How God could also be human. When we receive Christ, he comes into us. And we in him, as much as a created being can be, we are also an example of the union of human and divine. The humanity is ours, the divinity is God's, but there is a union of the two in us. When God made the world, he said repeatedly, for instance, let's take Genesis 1.11. And God said, well, find Genesis 1, 11. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit you yielding fruit after how? His kind. Listen to me carefully. I have to choose my words before someone tells me I'm speaking error. Listen carefully to me. The fruit tree producing after his kind. Genesis 1, verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. Cattle and creeping thing and beasts of the earth after his kind. Listen to verse 26. And God said, let us make man. Now change those words. And God said, let us make man. After our kind. Which meant God created a godly. As I said, you cannot create God. Not even God can create God, but he can create a being that would eventually be as close to being God or being like God as possible. In the faith I live by, page 66, paragraph 2, we read these words. Speaking of Lucifer, Ellen White writes, God made him good and beautiful as near as possible like himself. Hmm? The only reason... Why Lucifer was not a God like the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost is because you cannot create God. Listen to the words again. God made him good and beautiful as near as possible like himself. In the new world, through Christ, even before the new world, through Christ, we become closer to God than Lucifer was. Amen. Thank you for the amens. <laughs> but I wonder if you understand why you said amen. <laughs> Listen to me again. Listen to me again. The closest being to God created was Lucifer. Through Christ. You see, Christ was not in Lucifer. Did you hear what I said? Yes. Christ was not in Lucifer. Christ was not in Adam. The Holy Ghost was not in Lucifer. The Holy Ghost was not in Adam. Now the Holy Ghost is the spirit of Christ. Through the plan of salvation, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive the very spirit of Christ. So that Christ, spiritually, is literally in us. Amen. And we have a union with him 
which means with the Father, that no other created being has. You read John 17, I in them and thou in me. Read John 17 sometime from verse 20, 11 to 23. See how Christ describes the union he's praying for. It's as if you take a tablespoon of uh, some ingredient and then you pour it in a, in, a, in a glass. You take a tablespoon of something, pour it in a glass. Take a tablespoon of something else, pour it in a glass. Four things. You have the Father. I speak respectfully. Tablespoon of the Father. Tablespoon of the Son. Tablespoon of the Holy Spirit. Tablespoon of man. You mix it up. You have a solution. That's how God wants us united with him. Now, when you drink some lemonade, you drink in Fanta, you don't see the sugar, you don't see the citric acid. You, you, no, you don't. When we are one with Christ and someone looks at us and looks at God, the person has to ask, which one is Jesus? Ah, you're sleeping. This is God's desire for us so close. Only God can distinguish between Jesus and his follower. So close. Adam didn't have it. Lucifer didn't have it. Because Christ did not dwell in Lucifer. He did not dwell in Adam. I'll tell you something else. Don't be shocked. We are closer to Christ than the disciples were who walked with him. Because he walked with them. He was not in them. Are you listening to me? He was not in them. That's why he said, It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. That's why Christ said, I will send another comforter. He won't walk next to you. He will be where? In you. Now that's a union. When that's the case, whatever Christ is at the human level, you and I are. You want an example of love? Watch that man, as I said earlier. You're looking for patience? Watch that woman. You're looking for unity among the races? Watch that church. A sermon in shoes. Whatever Christ was on this earth, we are. Desire of Ages, page 664, paragraph 4. We read these beautiful words. Jesus revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that men may not have through faith in him. Mm. And we saw that. Well, we see it. Did Jesus raise the dead? Did the disciples raise the dead? Did Jesus cast out demons? Did the disciples cast out demons? Did Jesus heal the sick? Did they heal the sick? Did he open the eyes of the blind? Did they open the eyes of the blind? Yes. Jesus revealed no qualities and exercise no powers that men may not have through faith in him. His perfect humanity is that which all his followers may possess. Amen. How many of his followers? All. But there's a condition. If they will be in subjection to God as he was. You know what Jesus told Philip? In John 14, verse 8, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And Jesus answered him and said, What? Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? John 49, finish that verse for me. He that hath seen me have seen the Father. Listen to me carefully. When we are truly united to Christ, He's in us, we're in Him, we're in the Father. It must be said, he that have seen him has seen Christ. That's not a, something a human being can do of his own power. That's the working of Christ from within. My brothers and sisters, it is God's desire that we be love, not just have love. It is God's desire that we be the law. We must be the law. Not just obey the law. We must be the law because Christ is in us. Not because of us, because of who is us. If who is in us, if he's in us, what he is, we are. And so Paul writes, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, 
but Christ liveth in me, which means Paul was living the life of Christ. <laughs> you know why God took uh, Enoch up to heaven? Enoch was living the life of heaven. And he was altogether out of place on this earth. And God said, come where you belong. My brothers and sisters, let me close. We must be what Christ was on this earth. And I keep saying on this earth in his humanity. Do not leave this place saying that I said we must be God. Leave this place saying I said we must be godly, we must be godlike. Education page 18 paragraph 3. Higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. Godliness, godlikeness is the goal to be reached. Let me say it without any hesitation. Our characters must be the very character that Jesus had. No variation. That's why Paul writes, Philippians 2.5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, not a mind similar to it, the same mind. And if the same mind is in us, it produces the same character. Amen, amen. It's logical. But more than that, it is theological. Because Jesus says, out of the abundance of the, the mouth speaketh. It all comes from the heart. The heart is the mind. When we have the mind of Christ, we will live the life of Christ. And we will exercise or demonstrate the character of Christ. Then we become love in shoes. Obedience in shoes. Health reform in shoes. Strong families in shoes. Church unity in shoes. Forgiveness in shoes. Humility in shoes. Or if you have no shoes, barefooted. Are you with me? My brothers and sisters, let us desire a oneness with God that is so extreme that whatever we say is what God would say. Did you hear me? No, you didn't hear me. Let me say it again, <laughs> differently. Let us desire so close a union with God that our will is his will. Our thoughts become his thoughts. When Adam named the animals, how many names did God change? No. Not one. Because in his sinless condition, Adam's mind and God's mind were one. Listen to me again. That is God's ideal for us. That his mind and our mind would be united, connected. So we think his thoughts automatically. We speak his words automatically. We behave the way he behaves automatically because his mind and our mind have merged. This is a powerful concept. That begins at conversion. And when that is the experience of the person, don't tell me you cannot conquer homosexuality. Because there's no homosexuality in the mind of God. Are you with me? Yes. So if you have the mind of God, you will, you will get over that. With the mind of God, you cannot be a lesbian. Because there's no lesbianism in the mind of God. Are you listening to me? You cannot continue as an addict because the mind of God will change your behavior because behavior comes from the mind. Ellen White says, wherever the mind goes, the feet will eventually follow. 